Welcome everyone. I'm Christine Biglin with St. Mary's County Library and tonight we are joined with by Barb Whipke who is the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited, one store in Lexington Park, one store in La Plata um, and she has a broad base of knowledge about birds and wildlife in general and she is an excellent resource for us to learn more about the birds and tonight we are learning all about hummingbirds. Welcome Barb. Thank you. So basically what she just said was I'm a bird nerd. So hopefully lots of you are too. Um, tonight, it's all about hummingbirds. Um, hopefully lots of you are seeing hummingbirds. They are in the area. They showed up a little early this year, caught some of us by surprise. I know one of the girls here said that she was sitting there and all of a sudden a little hummingbird came up to where her feeder always hangs and was just kind of hanging out there like, where's the feeder? So I always tell people, once you are on their GPS, they will come back. So put that feeder right up where you had it before because they are going to come back looking for those feeders. One of the things you're going to notice right away is they're going to show up. You're going to see those males coming first. The males are the ones with the red breast. And then they're going to disappear. The females are going to come and then they're going to disappear. And then we hear every third customer saying, where did my hummingbirds go? Those first ones that are coming through are just using us. They are here to refuel and they are headed further north. So those ones are stopping. There's not a whole lot of insect and nectar sources out there since old man winter seems to not want to let go of us. So they are, our feeders are extremely important, especially to those ones moving through. So get those feeders out there if you haven't already, because they're going to use those to refuel and head further north. As we get into the first part of May, later April, those ones that stop by are going to be the hummingbirds that are going to spend the summer with us. So go ahead and get those feeders up if you haven't already. I'm going to screen share here with you and we're going to go through the PowerPoint and then we'll take that off and I'll show you some different products and feeders and things here. We'll talk about things in a little more detail then. All about hummingbirds. So first of all, as I mentioned, the male is the one with the red on him. The only hummingbirds that we have here is the ruby throated. We quite often hear people trying to explain that, no, I have some different kinds. I have one that has black. Depending on how you look at that little guy in the light, that red is going to sometimes appear black. But if you just move and look at him from a different angle, you're going to notice that that black neck now is red. That's just the light playing tricks on you. That little red area is always red. Just if you see it and it looks black, just change positions a little bit and you're going to notice that it really is red. If there's red on the neck, that is a male. If there's white, that is a female. As we get a little later in the season and they have start nesting and raising young, it gets a little bit tricky because the juvenile males will not have the red yet. But to start with at the beginning of the season, I can promise you the red is the male, no red is the female. This is a Rufus hummingbird. The reason I put those in here is sometimes we do have hummingbirds that will winter over with us. Usually in the winter, if we get one that winters over, those tend to be the Rufus. So we always ask if it's winter and you have a hummingbird that's hanging out in the winter with you, please snap a picture of those so that we can try to identify those. Because typically if it's here in the winter, it is a rufous. In that case, we'll work with you and try to see if we can get somebody out there to get those ones banded because that's a pretty cool experience. Um, those quite often, we have found that those will a lot of times come back for a couple years. 
if you've got that little band on there, you're able to see that it's your hummingbird coming back the next winter to spend with you. So when that happens, we do have, believe it or not, feeders that can be added to hummingbird feeders so that you can help those hummingbirds to survive the winters. That's few and far between. It's not often that happens. I guess I shouldn't say not often. We typically, two to three times a year, we hear about it in the Tri-County area. There'll be two or three of them that come and stay through the winter. So who knows, you could be the chosen one at any time. But just if you have any after October that are still hanging around, please get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do to help you out with those. So a few hummingbird facts. Typically, as I mentioned, only the ruby-throated are what we're going to have, and that's actually the entire East Coast area. That's pretty much what you're going to find. If you take a nickel and hold it, that nickel is going to be heavier than the weight of a hummingbird. So when you try to visualize or the weight of that nickel is going to be heavier than a hummingbird. They are extremely light. Here in Southern Maryland, typically mid-April to late September is when we have our hummingbirds. The last couple years, they have been coming earlier, and we've also been seeing them stay a little bit longer. We used to say, put your hummingbird feeders out by mid-April. The last couple years, I've been telling people, put them out by April Fool's Day. And this year, they definitely caught a few people off guard. They got here a little bit early. So definitely in the future, April Fool's Day is that goal to get those hummingbird feeders out there. Hummingbirds use their feet only for perching. You'll see some of the birds, you know, walking around the ground with their little feet or using their feet to hold their food and eat with. Hummingbirds are only gonna use theirs for perching. They're not going to use it for walking. They're not going to use it for eating, strictly for perching. A hummingbird lives up to nine years and they winter down in Southern Mexico, down to the Northern Panama. A hummingbird is gonna flap their wings about 53 times per second. I dare you to give that a try and see if you can do it. I bet you can't. Their flight speed is about 30 miles per hour at a normal speed. If they're trying to escape from something, it's 50 miles per hour. Crazy fast little buggers. They can fly right, left, backwards, even upside down. So pretty much any direction. If you've actually stood and just watched them at the feeders, it's amazing the direction. They're able to hover by just flapping their wings in a figure eight position. So if you've ever watched the way they hover, those wings are actually going in a figure eight position, but they're going so quickly that you're not even able, your eyes not able to follow that wing and the directions that they're going. Amazing little things. So their basic diet is flower nectar, tree sap, insects, and pollen. So that nectar that we're providing is just a part of their diet. Insects are a big part of it. If you ever notice when it's raining that they are spending a lot of time at your feeders, that's because insects aren't flying. Insects aren't as plentiful when it's raining. So it's more important that they have your nectar to get to. They eat about 50 times a day. This picture is actually one from my backyard. This was just a random sunflower that grew from some bird seed. And he was right there at that sunflower. They not only eat 50 times a day, but in large quantities. If you drank the way a hummingbird drinks in proportion, you would be drinking about a gallon in a single gulp. 
not a day, but a single gulp, a gallon every time. So the reproduction and life cycle. So the male mates with every female that comes in his territory. So that's why those males are getting here first. They're getting here, establishing a territory. Every female that enters, they're going to perform a courtship display and mate with them. During their, the mateship, the mating courtship, their wings are going twice as fast. Once they've mated, the male's done, he's out. It's up to the female to build the nest, lay the eggs, raise the young, protect the young. It's all on her at that point, he's done. He just moves on to the next one and just bebops around. So the, they're going to raise, the female's going to raise typically one to three eggs, but the most average is two because she's got to keep it a manageable number that she can take care of them by herself. So another thing we'll often hear is partway through the season, I don't have as many hummingbirds. That's because those females have to stay closer to the nest when they're nesting. They can't afford to go far from that nest to come to your nectar feeder. There's nobody to stay behind and protect the nest. So during that time, they need to stay close by the nest, look for pollen, insects, things like that. So you're not going to see those females coming as often to your feeders. They will still come, but not quite as often as they were. Once those babies hatch and are ready to leave the nest, then all of a sudden your population gets busy again. So nesting, the female's gonna build a nest about the size of a thimble, just a little tiny nest. Good luck at trying to find a nest. If you think about that thimble size out there in the woods, about 10 to 40 feet high in a shrub, just on a little branch, and they hold them together with strands of spider web. That little egg is gonna be about the size of a jelly bean. And actually the small, like the jelly belly jelly beans, so the teeny tiny jelly bean. That, the reason they're using spider web is because it's going to stretch. So as those babies grow, that egg, that nest, I'm sorry, is going to stretch, but it's going to hold those babies in there secure. So that's going to stretch and the egg's going to grow with them, or the nest is going to grow with them and expand, but hold them secure. Takes about six to 10 days for them to build that nest. Nests have been found in some crazy places, loops of chains, extension cords, wires, a little bit of weird places, but typically they're going to be out on a branch somewhere. People have been lucky enough to find them, but you have to have some serious good eyesight. Like I said, one to three eggs. She's gonna incubate those eggs for 12 to 14 days. And then those chicks are gonna leave the nest about 18 to 22 days. While they're here with us, she's gonna repeat that cycle twice. So she's gonna go back, find herself a man again, and then off she goes again to go through the cycle again. Threats to hummingbirds. Believe it or not, can you see that praying mantis on that feeder? Praying mantises are a huge threat. If you ever see a praying mantis hanging out there on your feeder, go out and shoo them away from the feeder. They will lay there waiting and they will kill a hummingbird. If you doubt me, Google it. You will find some gruesome pictures out there. They really, truly will. American kestrels, sharp-shinned hawks, things like that. Those are good eating for them. Frogs and fish, believe it or not, uh, the you know little pond in that, the hummingbird comes down, hovering over, catching the insects off the top of the pond, and the frog or fish will jump up and grab them. 
And sadly, outdoor cats are a big one. So definitely, if you can keep those cats indoors, that's the safest way for that one. Unfortunately, those other ones, um, most of those ones can't do a whole lot with. Pesticides are another one. If you cannot use the pesticides, if you can talk to neighbors, encourage them not to use the pesticides, the chemicals on the lawns, all that stuff. Anytime you can try to discourage the use of chemicals, it's a big one to help any of our songbirds. We've got, hey Chip, can you grab Nature's Best Hope for me? If anybody's looking for an interesting read along those lines, I can't say enough about this book by Douglas Tallamy. It's an amazing book. You can get it at the library. We sell it here. Um, see if I can get it up there now that you can read. Follow him on Facebook. This man is amazing. <laughs> Um, he's got a Facebook page, just unbelievable. We were lucky enough to hear him speak at a conference last year. He will open your eyes um, about the stuff we're doing. And, but yeah, Nature's Hope is the, the name of that book, but really good stuff. So as I mentioned, avoid pesticides, planting for the hummingbirds. Um, we actually, Christina will announce that one later, but our next next month's talk is going to be planting for the birds and the bees. Um, so that will be another talk on just some of the plants that you can plant specifically for the birds and the bees. You can add a basket with rotting fruits or bananas to attract fruit flies. Just one more thing, the green thing for squirrels, the corn for squirrels. <laughs> this is why I bring Chip. He's my runner. <laughs> After I start talking, I think of other things I should have grabbed. Um, this one is so silly. It, this silly little piece was designed to put ears of corn in for squirrels. A great thing to do with this little thing. You've probably seen these before. Instead, put a banana in and let it rot. The butterflies will come, suck the potassium from the banana. You can peel a little bit of it, of it but for the most part, you're going to leave it. If you'll remind me when I take it off share screen, I'll show you this again, and you'll be able to see it better. But peel a little bit of the banana back, back but put the whole banana in there and just hang it outside, back away from your door or porch some. Let that banana rot. The butterflies are going to come and suck, suck the potassium from it. As it rots, it's going to draw fruit flies. Those hummingbirds are going to come and get the fruit flies from this banana. You know, those fruit flies you don't want in your house. Now you're going to hang this outside and let it attract them. But it's one more great way to feed the hummingbirds. But remind me later and I'll pick that back up and show you. So red on your feeders, I know you go walk through the aisles of the big box stores and those hummingbird feeders have yellow all over them. Yellow attracts bees. We're trying to attract hummingbirds, not the bees to these feeders. So I wish they would not put the yellow on those feeders, but they continually do. You're gonna notice if you stop in here that our hummingbird feeders have red on them instead of yellow. Red is what we want to attract hummingbirds. A hummingbird can see red from three quarters of a mile away. You do not need those little pieces of yellow on there. The red is what that hummingbird is gonna zero in on. He doesn't need that yellow in there to make it look like a flower. Think red on your feeder. The nectar in your feeder should be clear. Don't use any nectar that has red in it. That red is not good for the hummingbirds. And then offer multiple feeders in a variety of locations. The more feeders you have in varying locations, I know you have all seen how those hummingbirds like to hoard those feeders. 
by putting them in different locations that prevents those hummingbirds from being able to hoard that single feeder. You put one in the front yard, one in the side, one in the back, one over there. That single hummingbird can't sit and hoard all of those feeders. So spread your hummingbird feeders around your yard. And then offer nesting material. Believe it or not, hummingbirds will use nesting material. You can use things like this, the regular little balls of nesting material. Have you ever been in the store and seen our little balls of nesting material like this? You can pop those out there. Hummingbirds will use those to build their nest with as well. Then choosing a feeder. You are looking for a feeder that's easy to clean. I know some of those glass ones are pretty, but pay attention to whether you're gonna be able to clean that feeder well, or whether you wanna take the time to clean that feeder well. Perches are a plus, and after I take it off screen to share, I'll show you that particular feeder a little closer. But as you notice, those hummingbirds there, that's in my yard. They are all sitting down on that hummingbird feeder. Hummingbirds prefer to eat from a raised perch. They don't have to sit there and hover to eat because they have a raised perch. They can sit and eat. It doesn't drip. Those hummingbird feeders where the bottle's up here and then the little spouts come down here. Gravity's working against you on those. So that bottle's here, the little drip spouts here and it continues to drip, drip, drip. So try to avoid those drip trays because that drip, that sugar water is gonna be down here, again, attracting those bees to your porch or wherever it is. Ant moats, we'll talk about that a little more when we come off share, screen share. Avoiding yellow, bee guards, again, we'll talk about that a little more. And I already mentioned that hummingbirds can find your feeder if it's red from three quarters of a mile away. Nectar recipe. You can use just plain white sugar. Please no honey, no organic sugar, no maple syrup, no brown sugar. I promise you we've heard it all. Please just good old fashioned sugar and water. You no longer have to heat it like we used to think you needed to heat it up as you just want it hot enough to dissolve the sugar. So as long as your tap water runs hot enough that it will dissolve your sugar, that's fine. The nectar bottle we have there works great. You can fill it to the, you can actually add a cup of sugar fill it to the 32 ounce line, give it a shake, fill your hummingbird feeder, put the rest in the fridge, does two things. One, it reminds you, first time you open the fridge, oh, I need to check the hummingbird feeder. And two, nobody's gonna pick it up and drink it because it reminds them that it's for the hummingbirds. So those are great. You wanna change right now, you're probably okay just changing your nectar every week to 10 days as cool as it's been. But as we get into the heat of the summer, it's going to be weekly. When it gets really hot, you're going to need to change it every three to five days. We do have an additive I'll show you, which is awesome because it doubles the life of the expectancy. I know any of you who have on here that have used it will swear by it. It is good stuff and makes it last twice as long. It's amazing. But basically, when you look at that nectar, if you wouldn't drink it, don't feed it to the hummingbirds. A hummingbird's tongue is longer than their beak, and they actually use it. A lot of people think they use it as a straw because that's what we were told growing up and they actually do not use it as a straw. They use it to lick at 13 licks per second. 
So that little tongue is just flicking really, really quickly. This is the amazing stuff I mentioned, Nectar Defender. Comes in a little bottle. You just mix it with your nectar and it doubles the life expectancy. Voila, Nectar Defender, please. So we've got that here in the store too. And it's amazing stuff. Keeps it from fermenting so quickly. The key is when you're looking at your nectar out there, if it starts to go cloudy, that's when you know it's time, which is another thing I like about this style of hummingbird feeder. Because the bottom is clear, you can see as soon as it starts to go cloudy. I can just glance at my hummingbird feeder. If it's cloudy in there, I know it's time, time to change the nectar. Port brushes to clean your ports. Uh, clean hot water is basically, if you're changing your nectar as soon as you see them start to go cloudy, you can clean those hummingbird feeders just with plain hot water. If it's looking a little grimy, add a little bit of vinegar to clean it. Don't really recommend soap. If you do need to use soap, then make sure you're doing a really, really super good job of rinsing all that soap off there. When you're refilling your hummingbird feeders, try not to let that nectar splash on the outside or that is going to attract those bees back into to the feeders. And then you too can feed a hummingbird with a little bit of patience. So this is out in my yard. Of course, that's a male because he's got the red neck there. And it takes no time at all to do this. This is with these feeders that I have here. They have a little hole in the bottom. I stick my finger up in the bottom, then I'll stand there with my phone this way. I, I would like to say I've got some magic skills and I'm a hummingbird whisperer or something, but that's not true. Seven or eight in the evening, that's when they're balking up for the night. That's where the hummingbird feeder hangs all the time. I just go stand there, hold it. I've got my phone to record. They're used to coming there all the time. They don't care. If you've been sitting outside, you've all been Zoomed by your hummingbird. They've buzzed you many times, I'm sure. They don't care. They just need to refill for the night. So they pop down, they eat, I record, that's it. After you've done that a few times, then you're going to take that feeder down, put it out of sight. Don't put it around your feet. The first time I tried the next thing, I put them down my feet, by my feet, they went down and ate around my feet. So I learned to put these ones out of sight and then stood there with our little nectar dots. And this one is the female you see there. And they will sit right down on you. You can hold them flat on your hand. They'll sit on your hand. Again, you're doing it in the evening, seven to eight in the evening. That's when they're bulking up for the night. Take those other feeders down. You're going to stand right where they're used to coming. They come in. Oh, there's red. There's my feeder. Boom. They're going to eat. Okay. I'm going to show you a couple things with those feeders now. So. This was the feeder that I mentioned. So neat thing about those, the raised perch I mentioned, also has an ant mode here in the middle. What that does, you're gonna fill that with water. Ants aren't able to swim. So when those ants come crawling down here, they're going to drown in there. 
You will see chickadees, goldfinches come hang and drink from here. So you'll have to refill that ant mode on occasion. They can get a protein shake from there. Easy to fill. You're not going to have that dripping like we talked about with those bottles and the gravity. They're just really easy hummingbird feeders. The bottom there, if you can see it, that's where I stick my finger in. Stand there, actually I do it left hand. Stand there, my phone's in this hand. Hold it, stay easy. Nice and easy, there's no trick to it. It's really easy to hand feed them. So those are amazing feeders. If you haven't tried these, these ones are awesome. You can also add weather guards to them. Cool things with weather guards. It's gonna add an extra spot of red. It's gonna keep your nectar from heating up as quickly. When it is raining, those hummingbirds are still gonna be able to come in and eat easier. So that's, those are cool. Another plus is window feeders. You can bring the hummingbirds right up to the window. A lot of our customers that live in condos and apartments love these ones but you can still hand feed them. A few things on this. So this part pops up. So the little suction cup stays on there. This part is your ant mode on that. So you're gonna fill that with water so that when those ants crawl up the window, this is where they're going to drown. This is gonna be the piece that you're gonna use to hand feed your hummingbirds on that one. So you put your nectar in there, you're gonna stand right out there and hold this to get those hummingbirds to come in and eat. And after you clean it, refill it, then you hang it right back up. So that suction cup is going to stay hanging. This is all you need to take off to clean and refill. So it's nice and easy. And if you have problems with birds crashing into your windows, anytime you can put window feeders on those windows, it helps to break up the reflection. The reason they crash into windows is they see the trees, the clouds, so they think they're flying into open space. So putting window feeders breaks up that clouds and trees, so it actually is helpful to keep the other birds from crashing into the window. So it's another plus. Real quick, the green thing I mentioned Maybe you can see it clearer here. This is what it was. Basically, an ear of corn would go in there and you would put that out there just to feed the squirrels. But you can instead drop a banana to feed the hummingbirds and the butterflies. If you already have a hummingbird feeder and you don't have a building ant moat, we have these little ant moats that can be added to your hummingbird feeder. So you would fill this with water and then you would hang your current hummingbird feeder under here. So when the ants try to crawl down the pole, this is where they end their life. Uh, I mentioned the port brushes for cleaning out the little ports, the little spots for the hummingbird feet. Basically looks like a mascara wand. Sorry guys, if you don't know what that is. But it basically it's just a little brush to clean those ports out. So those are helpful. One thing I didn't mention on that's the saucer style hummingbird feeder I showed you. You know with the reflection this one's tough to see but these are little rubber tips and they go over those ports what happens is the hummingbird tongue is long enough to go through there but a bees will not i always say these save my marriage my husband is a beekeeper our hobbies kind of interfere sometimes when it comes to my hummingbirds and his bees so with these on the hummingbird feeders, his bees weren't able to get into the hummingbird feeders. So I actually found this style hummingbird feeders way before I ever thought of opening a Wild Birds Unlimited. Back when he first started beekeeping and I started researching 
bee proof hummingbird feeders. <laughs> so these are awesome. This is better view of that nectar defender I talked about. It's an all natural substance, so it won't hurt the hummingbirds. Talk about the sugar, making your own nectar. We do have a clear hummingbird food that you can use to mix up yourself. The difference between this and the sugar you buy in the store is that this is ground finer, so it is much easier to mix up than sugar. I will tell you, we have it in the small packages or in the large can. I will tell you myself, I do use this one, it is just ground, um, more like a powder mix to it. So with using that nectar bottle, putting it in there, it's a real quick shake. And, and it has to scoop like the old Kool-Aid cans, flashback to the old Kool-Aid cans, right? It has a little scoop like that. And so it, it is really easy to mix up that one. Okay, and another fun, hummingbird thing is the hummingbird swing. This one is really cool. So the hummingbirds know they're not gonna sit and swing on it, but what it is, is a little perch that you're gonna put. So you have your hummingbird feeder placed here and you've all seen how the hummingbirds like to hang out and guard that feeder. So you're gonna place this swing somewhere where you can see it from the house. So you're basically going to give him a perch to guard from so that you still get to spend more time watching that guard. Their movements, because they're so jerky with their movements, will cause this swing to swing. So basically, they are going to swing. They're just not intentionally swinging. But it gives you more time to watch them. It looks like they're swinging. You can get some great photos if you enjoy taking pictures of the birds, get some great shots with this one. I leave them up year round because I find that the juncos, chickadees, titmice, the other birds like to sit on them too. So the hummingbird swing is actually one other. We talked about that nectar dot. Another cool one is the little hummer rig. So it is actually, these are especially cool if it's an older person or a young person with some uh, fine motor skills, this one is actually a ring that they can just put on. So it's easier for them than, than trying to hold that nectar box. So that's kind of cool too. Okay. I just wanted to totally off from hummingbirds, wanted to give you something to be watching your feeders for. Anybody that's been watching birds for a while will recognize the rose-breasted crossbeak. We had a first report of one just a little while ago at their feeders. So watch, this is the male. Hopefully you can see it well. If not, Google that and look them up because they are back in the area. They're just going to be migrating through. So they do not stay long. Watch your feeders closely. They do love safflower. If you've got safflower out there, or as Christine brought to my attention, our nesting blend has safflower. So if you're using our nesting blend, that's another good one. Watch for them. They are so beautiful. And it's usually just a couple days and they head on. So watch your feeders closely over the next few days for them. It's supposed to be a beautiful weekend. So it's a good time to be watching those feeders. If they're not full, get them full. Get some safflower nesting blend out there so you can keep an eye out for them. Let us know if you see them. If you're not able to see that, Google it and look them up. Rose-breasted grouse The female, and you can't see her probably. She definitely is a plain Jane, the poor girl. <laughs> she looks like a female house finch, except she's larger, rounder, and she has a white, some white eyeliner going on, kind of a parenthesis around her eye. But she's, if you're used to watching birds, you'll catch that she's different from a house finch because she definitely is a rounder, bigger bill. She's the same size as him. 
So watch for that. Okay. And then with that, what questions do you have for me? Okay. Um, you had mentioned like with the banana that the, um, that they'll eat fruit flies, but the question yes. was what other types of insects do they also eat? Pretty much anything, any insects. Um, spiders are a good one. Um, I caught a cool picture one time. I didn't realize I was catching that picture. I was just taking a picture of a hummingbird and then when I looked at it later, I realized the tongue was out and it was grabbing a little spider. But yeah, any insects. Insects are a large part of their diet. So another reason those? not to spray and kill the insects. Our songbirds need them. Hope insects are high. On, I mean, I hope uh, mosquitoes are high on their specialty <laughs> list. <laughs> um, okay, uh, a nesting question. Will the female reuse her nest with the second brood of eggs or does she build a new one? She's gonna build a new one. Pretty much all of our songbirds are gonna build a new one because just the bacteria and that, they wanna keep the babies fresh and clean in there. Okay. Um, and also having to do with nesting, do you need to keep the nesting material protected from the rain? Nope. Okay. Well, you don't need to because any nesting material we sell is designed to dry. However, with that said, the lacy one that I just, I do hang mine under a weather guard just because I leave it hang out there until they use it all. That particular red one, I use this one that we had. The reason I use it is because we sell, I use this one in a clear color. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but the reason I use this one is because we sell refills for it. So we sell just the insert refills in this. Then I can just keep using the red wire. So I do hang mine under a weather guard to keep it dry because sometimes it's going to be hanging out there for eight to 10 months. So it's all used up. But it's Definitely not required because it's made to quick dry and to be absorbent, the style that we set. Okay. Um, if anyone else has questions, type them in the chat. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about how they're territorial. Is that yes. the males and the females? Because I noticed it was mm -hmm. all females sitting together on their, your picture. Yeah. Well, truthfully, what that probably was, that was probably late in the season and that was probably all juveniles. And so there are probably just weren't as many hormones going on at that time because you don't typically, I've got one where it was a six cord and there were five on it. And you don't typically see that with coming birds until late in the season when there's a whole lot less hormones going on. Do they like attack each other or do oh, they yeah. just stay away? Like not viciously, it's just like zoom, zoom. So, yeah. But, but there's only one, is there only one male in an area? You said that they sort of control. They, they claim a territory, but no, there'll be several males in. I don't have a lot of respect for the males after what you were talking about, but that's okay. We're going to feed them anyway. That's how it is. <laughs> so the, uh, the recipe for making nectar, for making the nectar, you said it was four parts. Four parts water, water one part one sugar. part sugar. No okay. organics, no plain table sugar. Okay. Like that everybody tells you not to eat. You, I know, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um. Oh, a migration question. You mentioned that they go all the way down to uh, Mexico and Panama. What is their route? Um, Steve asked, I'm, I'm wondering, maybe that's like over land or over sea. How do they get there? It's actually over land. Um, and I will say that just like, you know, it used to be like the Baltimore Orioles completely left the U.S. And we're with the weather pattern changes this winter, we had a lot of Baltimore Orioles, not a lot, several Baltimore Orioles that wintered over here in Southern Maryland. 
So same in the winter, I've gone to Florida and there has been hummingbirds in Florida. So I think we're seeing the same thing with the hummingbirds. So yes, it is over land, but I don't think they're necessarily leaving the U.S. all the time anymore either. It's an amazingly long flight. I know. Compared to like the size of the bird. Exactly. That's amazing. Exactly. Through Texas and I, woo, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so do you have a recommendation on how far apart your feeders should be? So if you remember that first picture I showed where it was a display and there's probably five or six hummingbird feeders, that is one of my setups at my house. So I have a little bit of everything. I have some setup where there's only one hummingbird feeder. And then I have a couple other setups where there's four and five hummingbird feeders. So I've found a couple things that by setting one up, that feeder is pretty much limited to one hummingbird. But I have also found by setting up some pole setups with multiples that it's just too many feeders for one to hoard. So it has, that one's grown into a, like a little community feeder. So if you're only going to put up three or four feeders, I would say put those, spread those three or four feeders out into three or four locations. If you're going to do like some people and put up 15 or 20 hummingbird feeders, then it's okay to maybe have a community station and then some other single ones. But there really is no right or wrong way to do it. You will get more hummingbird feeders, obviously by having more feeders. But if you have fewer feeders, you definitely want them in single locations. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so let's say you had three feeders. Is there then a minimum? Three locations. Yeah, three locations. So I would What's say minimum front, distance? back, by the house. How, how far apart, like what's the minimum amount of distance? I would say out of sight of each other is what I would say in that case. So that he can't sit, or I keep saying he, but it really isn't just he. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, so I would say don't put those two right here where that hummingbird could sit here and guard both of them. Because they will, if those two are inside of each other, they will find a location between them so they can guard both of them. Even though they don't need both of them, they will do that. Those little guys have a lot of issues. I think. <laughs> no, like I said, it is females too. Okay. Um, well, I don't see any, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I think that you did a really great job covering all of it. Oh, whoops, sorry, there's one more. Um, oh, how long do hummingbirds live, Steve asks, and do they migrate back to the same neighborhood? Yeah, so they live nine years and they do typically migrate to the same neighborhood. Um, funny story, we had a customer come in here one day and she said, I have this hummingbird that keeps coming to my window. And I said, well, did you have a feeder there last year? And she said, no, we just moved into this house. And I said, well, guess what? The people that lived here before did. So you need to put a feeder on that window. And because they will, they will come to where they remember that feeder being, which is how we have realized that they come. One of our team members here, she hadn't got her feeder out yet and the hummingbird showed up right to the spot where her hummingbird feeder was. She quickly went and got that feeder up. <laughs> so, yeah, they definitely, you know, we, we don't know for sure that they all come back, but it is definitely very apparent that a lot of them do come back. Um, for years, I had one that I knew it was the same one based on a spot on the wing, and he would come and sit on the same broken branch and watch the same feeder. And, you know, you could, so in this case, you know, it was based on a spot on the wing 
and the location where he would always sit. Wow. Um, with such a long migration route, are there places that they stop? Like, are, they're not just obviously native to around here. So they have other places that they stop and will like revisit. Right. So live, like this right? one that stopped at Nancy's to get something to drink. He's not her hummingbird that's going to stay with her all summer. He's one that's going further north, but he has refueled at her feeders in the past. So he was stopping to refuel, but he's going on further north. But this is a gas station. He's, you know, just like when we travel, we have those certain gas stations that we stop at because they have the best fudge or whatever. Uh, and so, I, you know, he you have my he has a feeder there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know where the good wawas are. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, okay. Well, oh, are, are, do they live all over the country? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I know we have them all over the U.S. It's different types. If you ever get a chance to go out west, that is the place to really see the hummingbirds. They, you know, out in the desert and that, gosh, um, like Washington State and that, they get winter hummingbirds and that. So, yeah, we kind of get robbed here on the east that we only get the one type of hummingbird. So, it's yeah. Different yeah. Varieties. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there's some amazing. Um, if you look up the Anna's hummingbird, which is a beautiful one, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different types. Yeah, we are kind of get the yeah, <laughs> We're, we can get robbed on that. <laughs> but yeah, if you get a chance, yeah, go to the West Coast and check out hummingbirds. We did get really lucky. Gosh, it must have been like three years ago here that it was in the winter. We got a call here. Somebody had a hummingbird. And so we went out. I went out with a bander and we were expecting to find a Rufus hummingbird. And now I am drawing a complete blank of what we found. Um, can you help me here now? But yeah, I can't even. It was a hummingbird that should have never been here. It was not a rufus as we were expecting. Um, you know, how it got to the East Coast, we have no idea. A black chin, thank you. A black chin hummingbird. So basically, looks a lot like the ruby, but it is a purple where the ruby is red. But yeah, um, it this was a juvenile, so it had just a couple little purple feathers so far. So it had no idea how it got here. So that was a really cool experience. Um, a lot of. Fortunately, the customer was very kind and let a lot of people schedule appointments to come out and see this hummingbird because it was a lifer hummingbird, you know, an opportunity to see a hummingbird that you would never see. Isn't that cool? Oh, there's a question about the banding because you had talked mm -hmm. about the Rufus hummingbirds you can get. Um, okay, so since the birds are so light, what is the band made of and how can you see oh it? Gosh. It is like this thin little wire, like a jewelry wire or something. It's just, so, there's no way I could do the banding of it. And I don't even know how he reads the number on it. But yeah, it's just like a, a jeweler wire, you know, like a little piece of, for an earring or something, just a fine wire. Because it has to be so light that it can't mess with their flying. Oh, right. But it was my first time to ever see a hummingbird. So, and it's around so, their leg, I would imagine. It is, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. then that's interesting. So I guess they would only be able to use the bands like if the bird were found to have died, right? Oh, no, no, no. No, so what they do was the hummingbirds come into the feeder. So then they take a wire cage and they move the feeder inside the cage. <laughs> I mean, this is so old school. Like, so the cage, the feeder's now inside the cage, 
and then he stands with a uh, little rope tied to the door, <laughs> waits for the hummingbird to go in to get a drink, and pulls the door shut. <laughs> so the hummingbird now is caught inside the cage and then goes and grabs him really quickly, and puts the band on. So it all just happens so quickly. The hummingbird's not hurt at all. And it's just, I mean, it's- Well, that's like quite a skill minutes, set. The hummingbird's released and back at the feeder drinking in like minutes, like nothing ever happened. Sounds like, sounds like hummingbird rodeo. <laughs> yeah, it was just, yeah. But then how do they use the band in the future? I mean, would they ever like recapture the bird and try to read the numbers? And so what they do is when they come back, then just through photography, getting pictures and then zooming in on it just to read the band and just to, you know, kind of tracking that, you know, like I know in uh, Wildwood, there was a Rufus that came back. I feel like that one, that was a customer, and I think that one may have come back like three winters, I believe. And so they were just kind of able to to track and see how long it came back. And That's so cool. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any bird sanctuary type places or arboretums that have that would have hummingbirds in them? I am really not. No. Because it's so migratory, they wouldn't work in a confined place. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. It's just not something I've ever looked into. Yeah, I would say in that case, Google might be your friend. Yeah, there you go. Google yeah, knows so I, much. I would guess there probably is. I know when I lived in, I was a wildlife rehabilitator in, uh, when we lived in Chesapeake, Virginia. And there was somebody there that did a lot of, basically all she did was hummingbird rehabilitation. And so I know she had non-releasable ones, but I don't know where they, you know, who she released oh, those down. to. So I, oh. I'm, well, I know she had an aviary, but she kept some in. So I'm sure there is something out there. Um, if you were to see a bird with a band on its leg, who do you report that to? Yeah, so in that case, you would get the number and basically just Google bird is the band, bird, band, and up the information will pop. You can enter that number and it'll tell you who to report it to. Um, sometimes it's dependent on, you know, like if it's a pigeon around here, we find a lot of pigeons that are banned. Um, you know, with, there's a big homing pigeon racing pigeon club around here. So your best bet would just be to, you know, Google bird, banded, and find it from there. And then typically it'll have you enter a number direct you where to. Neat, but you would need to like get the picture and be able to zoom in to yeah. get the number. Yeah, you would have to have the number to be able to do anything. Sounds pretty tricky. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, pictures really are the way to go with that. Jake asked, where are your stores located? Oh, we have one in Lexington Park, which is in the plaza with Coles and Dick Sporting Goods down next to Buffalo Wild Wings. And the La Plata one is in the plaza with Target and Safeway, right tucked in between the two. All right. Well, we're right up to 730. So I would like to thank everybody for um, coming tonight. And especially I'd like to thank you again, Barb. It is always a pleasure to listen to the wealth of knowledge that you have about birds.